Welcome back. <clears throat> All right, this is the second of three lectures on the introduction to valuation. Last week, or last video, it was last week, but last video was focus on which discount rate to use in your valuation. And today, what I want to talk about is which cash flows to use in your valuation. All right, the way I set up valuation in the initial video the last video was that the value of any asset, and effectively we are valuing an asset, we think of it as a stock or a company, is essentially driven by cash flows, uncertainty of those cash flows, and then the time value of money. And when I talked about the cash flows, I said there's duration, magnitude, and growth. I'm going to unpack all of those over the next couple of videos, uh, particularly duration will be the next video. Um, and then last video, we talked a little bit about this idea of getting compensated for the uncertainty of the cash flows, the idea of cash flows from a company or an asset versus cash flows from a bond or some sort of credit instrument. In the credit instrument, the cash flows are contractually decided, so they're not guaranteed, but they're known. You always have a risk of default and things like that. And then we did talk a lot in the last video about the idea of time value and money. Cash flows in the future are not as valuable as cash flows today for opportunity costs and things like that. We went through it. Um, today, uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about is which cash flows you want to look, look at in your discounting. Uh, I set up that valuation, the fundamental value of any asset. This is true, by the way. This isn't a, a, a hack or a, or a rule of thumb. This is actually definitionally correct that the fundamental value of an asset is the present value of the free cash flows that asset generates over the course of the life of the asset. We're going to talk about duration in the next video. Discounted back for time and uncertainty. Often it's said discounted back for time and risk, and that's wrong. And I think I said last in the last video, I'll get to risk at some point in this lecture series, and we'll, talk, we'll distinguish between a really unpack the difference between uncertainty and risk. All right, so last week we talked about discount rate. Today I want to talk about free cash flow. That's that FCF in the upper right hand of the equation. And I want to define what we're talking about. All right, so my definition of free cash flow is uh, net income plus depreciation and amortization. You pull that out. Minus maintenance capex and that equals owner, owner earnings, which is what Buffett calls it. It's the same thing. Now, you could also start with a pre-tax number. Um, you can do it pre-depreciation, and then you subtract out maintenance capex, uh, and then tax effective, and that's your owner earnings. Now, what's really important is I want to talk for a moment this idea of depreciation, amortization versus maintenance capex. Um, what you'll hear a lot in uh, valuation and in finance is that depreciation and amortization are a non-cash expense. What's important to distinguish, and I'm going to come back to this point in a couple of slides, is that depreciation and amortization are a non-cash expense in the accounting period that you're looking at it. There was a cash expense associated with depreciation and amortization, Amortization could be goodwill, and it may have been financed with stock. But depreciation, there was a cash expense. It was before this accounting period. So let's not get uh, too carried away that something magical about depreciation. It's a non-cash expense in the current period. On the other hand, maintenance capex is a cash expense in the current period. Um, and we'll talk about that. So uh, we, we add back the non-cash expense in the period depreciation, amortization, but then you want to subtract off the maintenance capex. All right, so owner earning, uh, I'm going to use the same definition. All right, uh, one of the things you'll hear very quickly is why not EBITDA? Now, EBITDA is used in a lot of dis valuation discussions, particularly private equity discussions, a lot of investment banking, um, and certainly in uh, credit analysis, EBITDA becomes very important. Uh, but we're equity holders, so EBITDA is not really going to help us because there are uh, obligate financial obligations um, after EBITDA, the EBITDA line, before we get to those residual cash flows, which is what 
a shareholder owns. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about EBITDA. Uh, but before I delve into what I think are some of the limitations of EBITDA, I always like to ask, who invented EBITDA? Where did EBITDA come from? Now, my son is uh, was an investment banker. He's now in the private equity world. And I asked him this question when he was a young investment banker a number of years ago. And his response was, God invented EBITDA, which I always thought is pretty funny because he's closer to the truth than he realized. Um, but I think what he was trying to imply is that EBITDA has been around forever. Of course, EBITDA uh, is just one of those measures. When I asked this same question on my class in June at Columbia, uh, I asked that. And one of the students said, I don't care. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm a curious fellow. Um, I like to understand things. So, uh, But that may not be the, the case for everybody. So I said, what do you mean you don't care? And he goes, don't care. We use it. I understand it. I know where it came from. I know how to use it. And so who cares where it came from? And what dawned on me is understanding where it came from becomes very important because when you realize why it was invented and by whom, you start to realize that it is something that is effectively made up. Doesn't mean it doesn't have value, but unlike my son's response that it's been around forever, it's not. And it was invented for a very specific purpose. And I will argue to some degree, it's it's gone way beyond that initial idea. But uh, I'll, t I'll tell you the story momentarily um, because I think it's interesting. All right. So it's John Malone. Now, some people have no idea who John Malone is. Uh, he's one of the greatest deal makers in the history of uh, finance. Um, he has uh, been in the cable industry for a very long time, uh, certainly one of the pioneers of the modern cable industry, uh, and uh, made an enormous amount of money for his shareholders over the years. And he personally has made a lot of money. Uh, seems appropriate given how much how much money he made for his shareholders. I'm also told that he's the largest land owner in the Western United States. I don't know if that's true or not, but the case is. Now, the question is, why did he invent EBITDA? And that, to me, is really why uh, this question is interesting. All right, so John Malone is, was the president and CEO of Telecommunications, Inc., TCI, from 1973 to 1996. He sold the business to AT&T, that's how AT&T got into the cable business. I think he regretted the transaction afterwards and he got himself right back into the cable industry. Uh, but the cable industry, certainly early days in the 70s and 80s, was inherently a scale business. Uh, the programming expenses are effectively fixed. So the bigger your subscription base was, the more subscribers you have, the lower your programming costs per subscriber was and John got that very early on. Um, second is the cable companies are essentially a local monopoly with limited competition, fairly high barriers to entry. We'll talk about that in a couple of uh, couple of weeks. Um, and what he realized was is that he wanted to grow as fast as he possibly could because it was a local monopoly. Um, the second thing is that it's very sticky. Uh, people do not turn off their television service. Remember, at this time, it was television only. Now it's Internet access as well. But at this time, it was television only. And many people did not have access to television any other way. Uh, and what... Uh, uh, John and his team found out is that people were really reluctant to turn off their television service. So if they hit a financial hard time, they would cancel other things, cut back elsewhere. But TV was generally one of the last things to go. He figured that out quickly. So it's a scale business, essentially a local monopoly, natural monopoly because of the high fixed cost, high barriers to entry, high switching costs. So he loved the business. The problem with the business or the challenge was is that you have significant upfront investment to build out the cable network, um, which he did because uh, you had to lay all the cable and, and finance the cable boxes for each individual. And he also could make very favorable acquisitions because he understood the scale aspect. So it was a roll-up. He was a very, very effective acquirer, roll-up acquirer. And almost all of this was financed with debt because equity is expensive. He thought debt would be cheaper. The net result of growing fast, high debt levels, fast appreciation is he had essentially no reported net income. 
And this was a problem. It was a problem for the banks. It was a problem for the analysts early on before they started to understand the economics of the business. Um, but John got it. He understood that if I can go acquire customers, uh, I get more scale. I generally can pay. I don't have to pay a lot for those incremental customers, whether I acquire them or just go and build out my network. But it required a fair amount of capital up front. Debt was cheaper than equity. And so what he had to do was come up with a way uh, to convince financiers, more debt than equity, that they were looking at the wrong measure, that net income was not the measure of value. Um, and so he started to work up the P&L until he got to the first positive number, which was EBITDA, earnings before interest depreciation and amortization. That was the first positive number. And so that's why he did it. Now, I give him a tremendous credit. Now, uh, using the current language, um, we didn't use this language back in the 70s and the 80s, but the lifetime value, that's LTV, of a customer, a cable customer, was somewhere around five times the customer acquisition cost. And if you think about it, it costs you $100 to, to, to get a customer. They would generate 500 dollars in profit to you over time. If that's the economics, you want to grow as fast as you possibly can, because every dollar you invest creates five dollars worth of cash flow and and certainly multiples of of that dollar in terms of value. All right. So John had this simple problem in that the, by traditional measures, he wasn't making money that concerned the bankers, that concerned the equity analysts. And but he needed capital. So as I said, he worked up the, the P&L until he got the first positive number. Now, the reason I'd like to tell this story is that John Malone had a very specific application of EBITDA. Uh, he wanted to show that he had all this cash flow and that cash flow could be used to pay debt. It could also be used to finance uh, acquisitions and things like that. Um, we now use EBITDA throughout the private equity world and things, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, that would concern me. Now, at the end of the day, uh, we're equity holders. EBITDA doesn't do us any good anyway because we're residual uh, uh, cash flow owners, if you will. So John invented EBITDA to show the prodigious cash flow. I put that in parens that the cable networks produced despite their reported large negative net income, which was primarily aggressive depreciation and, and interest expense. All right. So that's where we are. Fine. Now, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, some of you may not have seen that before. Most of you probably have. That's the definition. Now, does that cause you any concern? Oh, I already said we're the equity holders, so we're not really, exp it, it's not EBITDA we're buying. But it should cause you some concerns anyway. All right, so the natural limitations are that EBITDA does not take into account maintenance capex interest expense and taxes. Now, for a lot of the purposes that people use EBITDA, finance debt, things like that, um, it's got some power there. Uh, however, uh, there is a limitation, uh, maintenance capex. Anybody who's owned a capital asset, a car, even a bike, an apartment, a house, knows that if you do not maintain that asset, its value will decline over time. If you do not protect those assets, they will not generate cash flow over time. So maintenance capex is real. Um, you could argue that uh, you want to look at this as a as a pre interest uh, cash flow because you're going to use that to finance debt. Okay. Um, however, as an equity holder, we also have to not only pay interest, but you have to pay taxes. But it's the maintenance capex that I think we really want to to focus on. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, I was asking another one of my students in the private equity world, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. We use adjusted EBITDA. I said, what's that? He said, well, we take into account maintenance capex. Well, it's not really EBITDA. It's something else. It's EBIT, uh, which is fine. All right. Uh, a little fun picture of uh, the goose that laid the golden eggs. If you don't take care of the goose, there'll be no more golden uh, 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 golden eggs. Uh, I put this chart together because I think it's kind of interesting. And uh, it's I just want to walk through it so it makes sense. Because in the private equity world, they'll often say, oh, we're only paying 12 times EBITDA. This is a cheap valuation. And I think in PEs and public markets and things like that. So I was curious, what is a 12 
multiple, an EBITDA multiple of 12 translate into a PE. And I quickly realized that if you don't take into account maintenance capex, you got a problem. And so what I did is create essentially five bands. You'll see them at the bottom. The blue dots are uh, maintenance capex is 10% of EBITDA. And then the green dots at the other extreme are uh, maintenance capex is 50% of EBITDA. And it has a very big impact on your valuation, as you, as you, as you can see. So if we look at it and we just, I, I picked this, the, the final one, that 14 times EBITDA multiple doesn't sound like a lot. It's only 14 times EBITDA. But if you have your maintenance capex is uh, 10% of your EBITDA, that's equivalent to a tw- almost a 21 PE, which I think people would say in this market is, you know, it's not cheap, um, but it's, it, I mean, it's definitely not cheap. It's not potentially expensive. But if your EBITDA, if your maintenance capex is 50% of EBITDA, then you're talking about something like a 37 times multiple, which I think everyone would think is pretty expensive. So this idea that we can kind of ignore maintenance capex, I never fully appreciated or understood it. Um, maintenance capex is real, a real and important. All right. So now what is the practical solution? NOPAT, NOPAT, net operating profit after taxes, which is essentially a cleaned up net income. Um, and I'm going to use NOPAT for all my valuation lectures going forward. Now, I want to make one more comment on the idea of maintenance capex versus depreciation. If you're approaching a company for the first time, you're starting to analyze it for the first time, you have to ask yourself, who knows more about that company, the accountants or you? And I would argue the accountants do. Now, over time, you may end up having a a, a wealth of knowledge about the company and really understand their financials. But up front, the accountants know more than you do. And depreciation, take amortization out of it for a moment. Depreciation is the accountant's estimate of the economic erosion of the assets. And I would argue that on a first pass, that's probably what you should accept as a reasonable first order magnitude estimate of the economic erosion of the assets. In other words, depreciation might be your best initial estimate of maintenance capex. And then as you get to know the company better, you can come up with a better estimate of maintenance capex and then make that adjustment in your NOPAT uh, calculation. So net operating profit after tax is what we're going to use um, uh, going forward. Uh, I think it's the cleanest way uh, to think about valuation, particularly cash flow. Now, the other comment I will make is, as you notice, is we've taken debt out of it. I am using a capital neutral structure, capital structure, without debt to determine what the cash flows are to the business. We're going to value those first. And then if it makes sense, you can lever it up. But leverage doesn't change valuation. It merely change, it levers up the cash flow. Um, another way of thinking about it doesn't really change the cash flows from the underlying business, just levers them up. And there are times where that's a very smart strategy um, because for in most situations, debt is a less expensive source of capital. And so if you can lever up the cash flows, that makes sense. But also for companies that have too much cash or a lot of excess cash, they effectively have negative leverage. And we want to think about that as well. So we'll go into these. But as a simple first order, we're going to use NOPAT as our estimate of cash flow in all of our valuation work. All right. So now getting back to this owner earnings, we just talked about this. You can do it another way. Uh, EBIT minus cash taxes paid. You can do it starting with net income, add depreciation, amortization, lots of ways to get to it. When you see the models we use, you'll see that it's very straightforward. All right. We talked a little bit about that. All right. So NOPAT equals owner earnings. That's going to be our definition for all the valuation discussions we have going forward. All right. Thank you very much for watching.